First, the four world-famous gymnasts share their horror and frustration with the Larry Nassar investigation. I don't want another young gymnast, Olympic athlete, or any individual to experience the horror that I and hundreds of others have endured. The emotional message and the response from the FBI to their criticism. You saw him handcuffed in court. Now State Representative Joelle Jones is accused of smuggling something into jail. The sheriff isn't laughing either. We'll have breaking details on that story. And here's Paul. Well, on a little more positive note, ooh la la, look at these temperatures. It is absolutely beautiful outside, but don't worry, the heat and yeah, the humidity too is going to be on its way back. We'll have the timetable for you straight ahead, first at four. Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News first at four starts now. Happy Wednesday, everybody. I'm Jason Colthorpe. Karen's on assignment today. First at four, gymnasts testifying on Capitol Hill today over accusations the FBI failed to act on information in the Larry Nassar investigation. Kimberly is in the newsroom monitoring this story for us, and she joins us now with the latest. Kim. Hi. Yeah, Jason, good afternoon to you. The testimony from the gymnastics champions was really heartbreaking at times. I listened to a lot of it today. We're following the Nasser scandal for years, as you know, but today the focus is on pressuring the FBI and other agencies to do better. Olympic gold medalist Simone Biles broke down as she shared her frustration. Listen. To be clear, I blame Larry Nasser, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. Today's hearing is part of a congressional effort to hold the FBI accountable after multiple missteps were found in the investigation of abuse claims against former gymnastics Dr. Larry Nasser. Hundreds of young women and girls say they were victims of Nasser over several years. FBI Director Christopher Wray was not in charge during the Nasser investigation, but he says he's heartsick about the actions and inactions of FBI employees who were involved in the case. These individuals betrayed the core duty that they have of, uh, of protecting people. They failed to protect young women and girls from abuse. Well, before the hearing even began, NBC confirmed one of the lead FBI agents on the case has indeed been fired. Michael Langman was reportedly the agent who interviewed Michaela Maroney about her allegations of abuse. Uh, Jason, there's much more testimony that we'll get to tonight when you join us for Local 4 News at 5. Until then, we'll send it back to yeah, you. Really stunning to hear the FBI's admissions on this today. Yeah. We'll see you then. All right, Kim, thanks. Sure. Breaking at four, State Representative Joelle Jones is facing a completely new accusation that he smuggled a handcuff key into jail. A court hearing on the new charges just wrapped up in Howell. The Livingston County Sheriff says the key was found during the intake procedure and it's led to two new felony charges against Jones. Just yesterday, he was taken into custody for violating his bond conditions as he awaits trial on drunk driving and other charges. You saw him being put into the cuffs right there. Jones pleaded not guilty today to felony weapons and escape from jail charges. Bond in this case now set at $100,000. We have a crew in the courtroom and we will have much more on this coming up on Local 4 News at 5. A civil rights group claims Ferndale police forced a Muslim woman to remove a religious headscarf. The Council on American Islamic Relations says Helena Bow was pulled over while she was driving on the Detroit side of Eight Mile Road in June. The council says she was stopped for an expired tag, but she provided valid registration and insurance. She was arrested for carrying a taser without a permit. Attorneys say officers would not release her until she removed her head covering for the mugshot. Bo calls the whole situation traumatizing. And I, and I beat myself up because I'm like, what's wrong with you? You're this strong individual. You know, I, I'm a strong person. And why wasn't that strong that day? Why didn't I say no? You know, why didn't I fight? But I was afraid to go to jail. I've never been in jail before. So, yeah, I, I want to make a change. I want, I want this to stop. I want women to have that choice to be able to keep their hijabs on during their mugshots. Now, within the hour, we've received this statement from Ferndale Police on this. Chief Dennis Emmy says the officers were following department policy. He says he will reach out to CARE to discuss how the police department can show more sensitivity for citizens of Muslim faith. The city will also set up religious and cultural sensitivity training for its entire staff.
An update now on the gas leak that has really tormented people in Flat Rock for about three weeks now. Ford Motor Company says it will send $500 checks to every household that was evacuated. Ford believes 1,400 gallons of gas leaked into the city's sewer system on August 26th. About 1,100 homes remain under observation. The city's mayor believes it could be weeks before residents can return home. An open house and town hall meeting that uh, was rescheduled because of yesterday's weather. That will take place tomorrow at 4 p.m. Well, speaking of weather, over the last 48 hours, we have dodged some, some uh, heavy stuff out there. Uh, if I'll, I'll let Paul decide on that. Uh, but we have a calmer evening tonight, Paul. Yes, a very pleasant evening. Look at this beautiful sky cam shot. Just gorgeous. And by the way, I want you to remember this little line of cumulus clouds here. We're going to come back to that in a second. Temperatures, if you're heading out the door right now, are in the mid 70s. Light breeze from the north or northwest. Beautiful afternoon. Now look at the visible satellite imagery. You see these clouds here moving to the northeast. Upper level winds are blowing from southwest to northeast. These are higher level clouds, but you can actually see here. That's that line of cumulus clouds that I just showed you looking up Windsor from downtown. That's that line right there. Notice these clouds are moving to the southeast because these are lower clouds and low level wind is blowing from the north or northwest. So you're actually seeing wind shear right before your eyes there. That's pretty cool. All right, temperatures falling quickly through the 70s into the 60s this evening, looking absolutely spectacular. But after a nice day tomorrow, the heat and the humidity is coming back. We'll have more on that coming up in just a bit, Jason. Windows open. Check. Got it. Yes. Thank you, Paul. The storm formerly known as Nicholas has now been downgraded to a tropical depression, but that doesn't mean the danger is over. This is some of the flooding already left behind. Drone footage so shows Sergeant Texas, one of the towns closest to where Nicholas made landfall when it was a Category 1 hurricane. The storm brought wind damage, a storm surge, and flooding to the Gulf Coast of Texas. And take a look at this video from Galveston, which was swamped with 14 inches of rain Tuesday. Residents are trying to clean up after the storm there. This could be a coming attraction, though, for parts of Louisiana, as the storm is expected to stall over the central part of that state tomorrow. Nicholas is the eighth storm to make landfall in the United States this year. We just received the newest COVID-19 numbers from the state health department, and it shows more than 6,600 new cases in the past two days. That's the estimated daily average now up to 3,300, which is the highest since early May. We've also seen an additional 62 deaths related to the virus, with 41 identified during a vital records review. The state only releases updates now on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Well, it's the debate that's been dividing school districts, communities, even families. How do we protect students in the classroom from the coronavirus? There's a lot to consider when you think about it. Science, safety, and concerns from freedom of choice. Now a group of parents is taking action, hoping to force a statewide face mask mandate. Our Paula Tupman spoke to the organizers. And Paula, how do they hope to put this into action and make it become a reality? Uh, hi, Jason. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, basically, it's to put pressure on the governor and the state health department. Uh, basically, they believe it is their job to create policy that protects the health of the public based on science and to not delegate or relegate those decisions to individual communities. Today, a petition drive is being launched by a group of parents from across the state who say it is time for Michigan's state health department to mandate mask wearing for all schools, students, and school personnel, saying that masks only work for all when worn by all. Our statewide coalition is launching a petition today that asks the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to implement an order requiring masks be worn indoors in all K-12 schools. As rising COVID-19 cases, deaths, and hospitalizations continue to affect Michiganders, including children. The group is called MyPass, or Michigan Parents Alliance for Safe Schools, who've organized to push Michigan's top health officials to follow the science. The group of parents talked about the divisiveness of the school mask issue. I am right! I have rights given by God. The divisiveness is clear and uniform across the state. Parents demanding masks be mandated to keep children safe against those who say masks in schools should remain a matter of personal and parental choice. Mary is from East Point and sits on the school board, which is in Macomb County, the only county in the Tri-County Metro Detroit region without school mask mandates. Sadly, we are now in an unprecedented place. Some school boards follow science and require masks, then get threatened with violence. 
Some school boards won't even take a vote because they're afraid of the threat of violence. I just pray every day that none of my kids get COVID, especially the ones with asthma. I also pray that my father-in-law, who's immunocompromised after having a double lung transplant, doesn't catch anything from my kids. Families shouldn't have to count on school boards for pandemic guidance because we have no expertise in epidemiology, infectious diseases, and mass casualties. That's why we have health departments, doctors, scientists, and infectious disease specialists. So when I spoke to the governor's office today, the media liaison was quick to point out that three weeks ago, zero school districts had mask mandate, mandates. Rather, Now there are 60, uh, or rather 60% of the school districts uh, have mask mandates, or I should say 60% of students are covered by mask mandates, going on to say, when districts and local public health leaders work together to implement mask guidelines, it creates buy-in at the community level which leads to better outcomes and better adherence to policies that keep kids, teachers, staff, and parents safe. That's part of the written statement that I was sent. So basically the governor's office is, is saying that in order to get more people to comply, they're just not going to jump into this. They're going to leave it at the district level. These parents say they have other plans. They're gonna put the pressure on. Jason. Yeah, and Paul, as you know, an ever-changing situation. We'll see if those stances change. Thank you. Millions of parents will see some extra money in their bank accounts once again. How much and how much longer will those payments keep coming? Also coming up, an historic trip into outer space, the mission and why 200 million is a key number here. And later, alarming research about Instagram, mental health in teenagers, especially teenage girls. The new report out about social media's impact. And we're right back.